So here's the route that would be taken up to the Arctic. From the very bottom right hand side, we left Grand Forks, flew to Salmon Arm, then to McBride, Fort St. John, spent the night there, and the next day up to Fort Nelson, to Fort Simpson, uh, flew to Wrigley, spent the night there, from Wrigley to Norman Wells, from there to Fort Good Hope, to Anubik, up to Tuck, spent the night there, flew back down to Fort McPherson, landed Eagle Plains at breakfast there, then Dawson City uh, had night spent the night there and to Whitehorse uh, to Watson Lake uh, Fort Ware um, Mackenzie down to 108 Mile Ranch and back to Grand Forks so it's uh, total time on route was uh, seven days uh, 3,300 miles it's a long ways to go on an ultralight not too many guys have been there in Grand Forks the weather was fair. But looking at the new four flight there and had the radar set up in it and I could see there was a few showers around Vernon I wasn't too worried but by the time I got there she was raining pretty good so I had to dodge away weather there and, and Simon Arm there just where I landed in Simon Arm there pretty small compared to the other plates <laughs> waiting there and had a pretty good shower there so I waited for an hour or so and I left Simon Arm up towards Adams Lake and kind of blew up above the clouds there this is Adams Lake the north part of Adams Lake and uh, just continued uh, flying north there towards McBride was the first place to uh, stop for fuel there. And uh, as I got closer to McBride, the weather got quite a bit better. And uh, you climb up in altitude quite a bit there. Even though it's July, there's still lots of snow up in the high country there. So just some pretty spectacular scenery as you get up in there. Well, the wind wasn't too bad there. We were able to fly around uh, 10,000, close to 10,000 feet to get up above those mountains there it's pretty high country there some glaciers there you can see there so it's uh, always a beautiful flight into McBride there you come up over the mountains and all of a sudden there's a big valley and you drop it down in the valley there you can see the valley there's some beautiful lakes there and uh, gets quite a bit warmer quite a long ways down the hill to get in McBride though you're up at 10,000 and uh, you go down about I don't know seven or eight thousand feet to get down to McBride there so there's the last of the mountains there, and uh, we pulled in McBride there for some fuel, and uh, we were, were on our way after that. From McBride, flew up to Port St. John, and uh, spent the night at a friend's place there, parked at the airport, and then had a little tour of our old cattle ranch up there. Pretty big acreages up there, uh, big ranches up there, typically from hundreds to thousands of acres. Hay fields are 100 acres or more, up to four or five hundred acres sometimes big fields and uh, the area wasn't really settled until the 1930s so the priests still actively clearing land up there and expanding building homesteads up there this is a picture of our old place up there there hand there that field there's about a quarter section still doing burning up there and uh, clearing more land for hay fields and heading further north you don't see any cleared land uh, this is an old fire station it's abandoned there lots of muskeg up there oil and gas activity in the area and uh, as we start getting closer to Port Nelson you don't see much of anything except just roads and muskeg up there and at Port Nelson we stopped and got some fuel there it's kind of unusual this is a beaver on wheels you don't see them very often on wheels usually on floats and uh, there's quite a bit of fire activity in the area fire base is pretty active there's uh, some fire cats there park there that uh, we're working on fires this morning and uh, north of Port Nelson we're starting to get quite a lot smokier up there there's uh, mostly all just muskeg and kind of flat country some big lakes and the visibility got worse and worse and it's getting pretty difficult uh, to make my way into Port Simpson 
I landed at the government airport there and took off from there. And then I landed uh, downtown at the Ted Grant's airfield there and got some fuel. He's got a company there that uh, takes people on tours. And off to Wrigley, so this is actually the Mackenzie River. It's quite wide there, um, big river camp there. There was a bear that was kind of bugging me there, so I left there sometime after midnight and headed to Norman Wells and uh, got a little bit more sleep there. We had 24 hours of daylight there uh, at this time. It was very, I think the last day of June. Leaving Wrigley, there kind of got a little fogged in the valley. The valley is quite wide. It's quite a bit lower than the surrounding countryside there, and the fog kind of sat in there, so it couldn't follow the river too much. It had to climb up a little bit to get out of the fog. But it was a pretty nice looking country. The escarpments are pretty neat to fly along. Um, it's kind of a big ridge, it almost looks like a man made trench all the way along there. And then at the very end there, we started running into a little bit of weather. Could see some thunderstorms and stuff, but I uh, was able to stay away from them and uh, fly right past them and, and made our way up to uh, Norman Wells. Landed in Norman Wells about 2 o'clock in the morning. It's really nice having 24 hours of daylight. You can just take off whenever you want and land when you want. Just stop when you're tired. Norman Wells uh, really got going uh, around the Second World War when they built the Alaska Highway. There was oil there discovered there a long time ago. And then they built a pipeline from there to Whitehorse. Quite a long ways. It was an uh, amazing feat actually. They built the pipeline and all the camps there. And they still produce oil there. Uh, there's a pipeline going south to Zama. Now, the little problem that I had there, um, I landed on July 1st and it was a holiday and everything was closed. There was nothing open whatsoever. You couldn't get fuel or anything. And then, uh, you know, I walked around town and I found out that there was a no time issue that I didn't check. And uh, actually, I couldn't buy any fuel. So luckily, I was actually able to buy some fuel from uh, one of the local outfitters, Max Wright. It was an aviation outfit and they were nice enough to um, to uh, sell me some fuel so just looked at the museum and stuff here about the Cannonwell Road and uh, looked at some of the artifacts and had a really nice walk around town and lots of old equipment and stuff there is no road in the Norman Wells you can only get in there by barge or by airplane uh, there's a winter road I guess but uh, you can't get there in the summertime um, there's lots of old artifacts there just a few miles of road and there's no way to get in or out and uh, this is the airport there and that's the outfit there that actually they sold me some fuel so uh, I had to go uh, and fly to uh, the next town uh, Fort Good Hope to actually pick up the fuel they had some fuel there so starting to get into some just beautiful countryside leaving Norman Wells um, there was kind of big escarpments coming out of the Mackenzie Delta uh, it's quite stunning actually to see some of these big rocky outcrops and really enjoying the countryside there going north uh, Virtually no signs of humans whatsoever. You're on the river. There's uh, not much for roads. The odd little tower on top of a escarpment somewhere, but um, pretty isolated area. So um, yeah, I got some fuel at Port Good Hope and then uh, to Anubik. And so I just landed in Anubik real quick, topped up my fuel. Um, it's quite a long ways in the town, so I didn't bother stopping there for very long. And uh, then I headed back out on the tundra. Uh, for the final leg into Tuck and so the country really changes when you leave uh, Anubik there get into the tundra there and there's no trees you're above the tree line so here's a movie that I made going into uh, flying into Tuck so I grabbed the bite to eat at the restaurant there and uh, filled up the plane and uh, we went to, on the last leg of the tour heading for Tuck pretty exciting the country really changes dramatically north of Anubik um, you know, there's no trees and a lot more water. You see a lot of birds nesting. Uh, lots of birds go up north there and spend the summer there. Um, 24 hours of daylight, that takes a little bit of getting used to it. Uh, the sun kind of, you know, goes near the horizon a little bit, but it never doesn't really get dark at all. Uh, when I was in Tuck there, there's, uh, you know, people out at uh, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. I left. Tuck at 2 o'clock in the morning and, uh, you know, it just seems like things are going 24 hours a day. Uh, it, um, it's kind of really different eh, from being down south. Uh, the long days, I guess uh, they get the rest in the wintertime. But, uh, so we're following the road. Well, there's no road here, but as you get closer to Tuck, uh, you can pick up the road a little bit. They're building a road to get there and uh, in the summertime, uh, 
normally there's no access in the summertime except by air. And I, I guess there's a barge that comes uh, maybe once a year. So I so you'd probably pull freight up on the on the shore there. I didn't see any kind of a terminal or anything there. And there's quite a few people have little boats and stuff and tuck and they're uh, busy fishing there and cutting firewood and stuff like that. I'm surprised actually all their lumber, lumber, they have lots of logs and stuff they use for firewood, but they don't have no sawmill or nothing. All their lumber is sold from down south. Must be pretty expensive to buy anything there. Tuck is a pretty small village and it's, I don't know, I don't know, maybe four or five hundred people there. But, you know, newer pickup trucks and everything, the housing's not that great there. It's, uh, you know, kind of a typical northern community. They do a bunch of drilling up there, so you can see a drilling platform there. But, um, so we're getting a little closer to Tuck now and uh, we're just starting to pick up the, the highway here. Um, it's about four miles, I think, uh, from Tuck where they got to. And um, I took a bunch of pictures, eh? so uh, we're just going to land at the airport. We'll follow the highway in and um, we'll show you around town. And we're going to chat with a few people and uh, stay for the Canada Day celebrations. And then um, we'll head back on the plane and uh, head her south again. So uh, here's the pictures that I took while I was in Tuck. We're following the newly constructed highway into Tuck here for the last four miles or so. It's pretty windy. It doesn't take long uh, for the land to be gone. And the water takes up the majority of the landscape there. It's just like an island there. It's kind of an amazing feat for them to actually build a road out to there. You'd think there's no way they could ever build a road there, but they're working on it. One of these days they'll be connected to the rest of the country. This is a drilling uh, rig platform where they're drilling in the Beaufort Sea in the winter time. And uh, here we are on final here. We're just uh, coming into the tuck here for a landing. And uh, it's a gravel runway and here's the terminal. So roll to the terminal. There's no other aircraft there at all. I didn't see any planes there. Um, that's the end of the runway. Looks like uh, it's right on the edge of the ocean there on high water. Looks like there's a driftwood there coming up there. And here's, I guess, the guys that didn't make a very good landing there at the end of the runway there. They, a little place for them there. And uh, here's a picture of some uh, pingos. Uh, they push right up out of the frost to push right up out of the tundra there. They're Quite interesting looking uh, feature of the landscape there. There's quite a few of them in the tundra there, around the tuck there in that area. And this is just uh, some tundra there, and that just kind of gives you, shows you what the, what the, what the uh, vegetation looks like there. This is an ice house that uh, was built uh, to store ice in the old days before refrigeration there. They just packed the ice in muskeg, and uh, they would have uh, ice to, to last them through the wintertime to keep their groceries Fresh. This is a Richardson ground squirrels. They're kind of pretty friendly little guys there. You can just, just about pet them, I think. They're not scared of anything. We're looking out the Beaufort uh, Sea here. Uh, actually, looking out towards Russia, if you could see far enough. And that's a uh, whole salt water there. It's a dog sled, uh, I guess, there from last winter. For, left to park there, waiting for more snow. This is the end of the Trans Canada Trail in, uh, in Tuck. And uh, they have a little Canada Day celebration there, and they have a little party there. It's lasting in the midnight there when I was there, and uh, there was a bunch of people running around the bay there, and water skiing, and swimming, and having a good time. It was a pretty nice day. It was out there in shirt sleeves. That's a radar base, part of the distant early warning uh, dew line there, and uh, keep an eye on the air traffic there. And one more shot of tuck before we leave, and head south. So I left Tuck at about uh, 2 o'clock in the morning after a little sleep, you know, still lots of sunlight, and uh, headed towards the Mackenzie Delta. So um, this is where the Mackenzie River gets really wide. I don't know how many miles wide it is, but um, there's not much of a change in elevation between there and the Beaufort Sea. And it's just a huge uh, place for wildlife, you know, um, all kinds of birds, thousands and thousands of birds. You just see them nesting everywhere. And you know you got 24 hours of daylight, and there's lots of bugs there. It's mostly all water and bugs, so it's just perfect for birds to go up there and nest. And you know that's why you see so many geese and sandhill cranes and everything heading north uh, in the springtime. Uh, they go up there and nest, and you can see the sun on the horizon there. So it doesn't get much lower than that. It just doesn't get dark. <laughs> you know it gets a little, a little bit, a little bit darker, but not very much. And then. Uh, you're in sunlight again. It's pretty neat. So the weather, uh, we're having to dodge some clouds a little bit. 
Ooh, we stopped and land here at Port McPherson. Spent the rest of the night there. And uh, the next kind of morning, I guess, or whatever, we took off again, heading south. Um, start to slowly get out of the tundra there and uh, get into the Richardson Mountains. And uh, the countryside really kind of starting to change from tundra into these uh, treeless mountains. They're quite spectacular in some of these areas. At uh, Eagle Plains, we landed there and had some breakfast. Uh, peeled up the plane. They're kind of surprised to see me landing on the highway. It was uh, raining a little bit, but not too bad. Had a really good breakfast, good feed there. Enjoyed that and uh, then took off from pretty much from the parking lot. The highway's easy place to land there. So we're back into the mountains there and uh, the trees are starting to see a few trees there, but uh, really rugged uh, ground to go through. And it's neat with the synthetic vision because uh, on the floor plate you can kind of see how the mountain's shaped there and uh, with the weather if it's a little low you can kind of see your way ahead there further you can see by eye and navigate your way through that on the way to um, Dawson City. But some really spectacular uh, uh, scenery and along the Richardson Mountains I really kind of enjoyed uh, flying through that area. Really rugged area. Looks like a good place for uh, big game hunting. Lots of places where you can land a a bush plane. You know, they didn't see a lot of strips, but it's the kind of country where you could land bush plane pretty easy. And then uh, the weather started to kind of really bog in there, so I really had to use the synthetic vision to, to keep going. I could have landed on the highway if I got into trouble, but it worked really good with the synthetic vision. And uh, there we landed at uh, a white horse there, right in front of us, 737. He <laughs> landed just in front of me. Here's a video of him taking off again. I'd take a after landing in Dawson City, I was quite surprised to see the 737 there taking off from uh, actually a pretty short airstrip. Uh, it's a 5,000 foot and it's a gravel airstrip. So uh, they have special modifications made to uh, blow the rocks away from the front tires so they don't get ingested in the jet engines. And uh, they land there with the cruise ship passengers and take them for a little tour of Dawson City and then fly back to Juneau. So it's quite something to see. This is the road from Dawson and along the highway right into town from the airport. And what we're seeing here is uh, all the tailings from the dredges. Um, you'll see them here in a little bit. They're just massive. Eh? These uh, tailings are maybe, I don't know, 50 feet high and 50 feet wide. And they had, I think, 13 dredges working around the, you know, the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, they were working in through that valley and going through all the, all the gold there. And the big deal... To that was sawing the ground out so they had a whole bunch of um, fires going and steam pipes and a whole bunch of other things to thaw the ground out so they could actually uh, mine this stuff because it's all in permafrost so they had huge a lot of crews and stuff uh, melting this uh, material so they could uh, you know go along with the dredge here and uh, collect all this gold so um, pretty massive uh, undertaking there it kind of uh, made a heck of a mess there but pretty impressive but the same time so um, so we're just coming into Dawson here and we're going to go for a little tour around town and we're going to spend the night in Dawson so uh, we'll show you what it looks like from the air here Dawson's not a very big town but it's almost like a living ghost town it's pretty busy there lots of old historic buildings some of them are fixed up and some of them aren't a lot of tourists there but also pretty active for mining so it's just right on the Yukon River there, and um, it's all dirt streets. There's nothing paved, and uh, pretty interesting place to wander around there and look at some of the old history and, and the buildings. There's about 30 or 40 big mines operating there with lots of big equipment. So, you know, they're still getting all their parts and their supplies from town. So you see them, miners in town with their old rusty old pickups and walking up and down there. So it's a pretty good mix of tourism and, and business there. So this is the hotel I stayed in at the Yukon Hotel. There's an old original building from there. They had a courtesy car, picked me up, and uh, yeah, it was pretty comfortable there. And went for a walk around town and checked out the sights in Dawson. Pretty much all uh, wood sidewalks there. There's uh, no paved streets in town whatsoever, so it gives you a real kind of a feel like you're an old western town clunking around through the sidewalks there. Other than a few cars being on the streets, it, it almost seems like it would have been like a hundred years ago. Lots of, uh, you know, false fronts and 
storefronts. This is actually Robert Service's cabinet, the original cabinet Robert Service had when he was in the Yukon. Uh, this is a big gambling hall and uh, showgirls and stuff. I didn't go with that. This, this great big house here actually belonged to the gold commissioner in Yukon at the time. The building was over 100 years old. So the next thing on the agenda was to go for a tour of the gold fields. Uh, quite a massive uh, operations that they have there. You can just see the equipment and stuff uh, roaring around. They're pretty busy, probably about 30 or 40 outfits there. I really wanted to try to uh, see some of the stuff that they had on Gold Rush there. I wanted to uh, try to have a look at Tony Beat's dredge if I could find it, but I couldn't get into that valley. Uh, it was just uh, too, uh, too foggy and too much rain and stuff, so I ended up going up uh, Indian River and I had a look at, uh, I think, the one here that we're looking at is um, is Todd Hoffman's uh, claim there, a big uh, red dredge that they had there. Um, this one here is uh, on the way up the Indian River here. Quite a few uh, big massive operations, the same as they got on TV there. You know, they have a couple of features on, on, some, of the, on some of the gold shows, but uh, there's quite a few more operations about the same size there. So, um, it's, uh, all the gold mining is within probably about I don't know, 25 miles of, uh, of Dawson and kind of a circle around there and there's nothing past there. This one here I think is Todd Hoffman's um, just because of the way the building, uh, the one cabin was there and the big dredge that they had there. Pretty interesting to have a look at all this stuff though. On this shot here, you'll see a little guy in a little black pickup there. He's just going crazy. They're doing donuts. Good thing he didn't drive himself off the road. I Kind of imagine maybe that would be Parker from Gold Rush, but uh, I have no idea. But, uh, kind of noticed it uh, from the air. I thought, geez, what the heck's wrong with this guy? But again, so we're up at the very end of uh, Indian River there in this one. And uh, like I say, you just see the size of the camps. And uh, it's amazing just how many people um, are, are in some of these operations and how much iron they got. Big cats, you know, they'll have four or five big cats and hoes. And this sluice plant is just uh, huge. You've got two big conveyors, a bunch of hose working there, big tailings things. And you can see quite a variety of country there. There's uh, this, I thought maybe this was Todd Hoffman's camp here. I don't know if it is or not, but it looked like it to me. But So this is kind of an interesting story. This here's uh, back into Dawson there, where the, drill, where the dredge uh, was. And you can see it up, up in the top uh, of the screen there. There was a big gold mine there and they shut down just suddenly in the 60s and the guy told me the story that they had a museum there where they used to take tourists and stuff but then they found there was a whole bunch of arsenic and stuff in there so it was too hazardous to continue and they shut it down but apparently you can still kind of go walking in there it's not even locked um, but what happened uh, last year was there was a great big huge uh, hole that uh, fell and right in the middle of the road there and they looked in there and they found a whole bunch of old tunnels and shafts that nobody even knew were, they were there eh? so they were exploring them so still lots of cool places to go and uh, go exploring and see things it's not like uh, it's all been explored there's there's lots of stuff all kinds of old iron um, shafts um, you know you can drive around there for weeks i'm sure and check all this stuff out so Pretty exciting. So uh, yeah, so that's the road back into town. It's an uh, area that's got had a few more dredges in it than, than other areas that we saw. All right, this was one more uh, location there that uh, had a little airstrip in it. So there was a mine there. It was up at uh, Indian River there. See the little plane on an airstrip there, but really windy there and it was raining lots. So I didn't really want to even try to land that. Shouldn't land at people's airstrip without a permission anyhow, but uh, it wasn't good weather for that so well where we went uh, took off heading south again next uh, stop would be Whitehorse but I have to fight quite a bit of weather before I got there so it was just a real nasty day it was raining and visibility was poor and really windy spent the night there and next morning the weather cleared up it was quite a bit better and uh, took off to Watson Lake uh, pretty nice uh, trip there really uh, get into the into the mountains there Looks like a beautiful area for hunting and stuff here. It's seen lots of big open areas uh, where there's quite a bit of feed and stuff. I imagine uh, lots of big uh, game outfitters and stuff in that area towards Watson, Watson Lake. There are some really big valleys. Uh, you fly across, uh, must be about 40 or 
40 miles or so between peaks. Um, it's quite a scenic area and not really that high. Uh, I was started out along the VFR route, but just ended up flying over top of the top of the clouds there. And it's a really kind of a pretty relaxing uh, day going to uh, to Watson Lake there. Put uh, quite a few miles on there. So here's Watson Lake there. Stop there for some fuel, and uh, then we made our way south there uh, through the trench. Here. This is just a real beautiful little lakes. So They're really colorful, quite of a blue color. Not sure what attribute to that. Just no other ones I ever saw like that in that area. But, uh, uh, we've seen quite a few forest fires there and that's starting to get worse and worse. And we kind of figured, well, we just kind of didn't seem that bad. I could probably get around it or through it. So uh, I figured, I'll just put my nose down and go through it. And it just got thicker and thicker. And before I knew it, I was just socked right in. I couldn't see a damn thing. Just pure white. So just flying on instruments and all I could do is just keep the wings level and uh, just keep climbing and climbing and up to 10,000 feet and see. Works pretty good with the synthetic vision. You keep on course and you, you can't see the ground, but you know where you were. So it turned out okay. I was a little nervous, but uh, you got to do what you got to do through the smoke. And, well, eventually, I started heading towards Fort Ware there, and the smoke uh, got a little thinner. And I was able to land and I uh, put five gallons of fuel that I had my plane in there quick and took off again down Willison Lake there. A really beautiful flight along there. Lots of little, little airstrips there. I didn't land in any of them, but I could see them there. Continued south along Willison Lake there. Landed at Mackenzie there. Got uh, fueled up and got a nice green cone there. Always friendly there. Enjoyed uh, stopping there for a little visit. And then I was off to 108. My friend Willie Trinker met me at the airport, took me home. Fed me supper, spent the night there. This is a little video that he shot while I was there. Willie was my flight instructor. That's who I took my lessons from. So I bought my first plane off of him. Um, so he's been a good friend of mine and always enjoyable visiting with him. Next morning, I hopped in the plane and pointed her south. Had a beautiful flight back to Grand Forks there. A little bit of fire near Kelowna there. But made it home, no problem. Um, well, I hope you guys enjoyed the show, and uh, we'll see you next time on yet another exciting adventure.